everyone! Welcome to Finding Pieces. We're in Season 1 on Piano Rolls. In this episode, we're looking at the popular genre from the mid-1910s to the mid-1920s and a person called Edgar Fairchild. You're listening to Finding Pieces, a podcast on pianos, people and music. In the last episode, we talked about ragtime, which rose to popularity between 1900s to 1910s and subsided into other forms, such as the novelty piano style and jazz. Novelty piano music is essentially a subgenre of ragtime, and the earliest composers who composed in this style were piano roll artists. The first example of this is a credit to Felix Stand for his 1915 composition Nola, written as an engagement to his fiancée and later wife, Nola Locke. This piece demonstrates how novelty piano music is a distinct style from ragtime and other jazz pieces. There is a more sophisticated dance pattern with this characteristic break and more elaborative harmonies. Another composer who was famous for the novelty piano style was Zess Comfrey, whose composition Kitten on the Keys in 1921 further popularized this style. This opportunity is created because novelty piano pieces have less syncopated rhythmic pulse, usually using triplets and dotted eights or sixteenth notes. So this is da 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 or da 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 rather than syncopated eight note patterns of ragtime and other jazz styles. Boom ba boom ba boom ba boom ba. The reason for this difference, as some people have observed, is that the composers of this style were mostly white Americans with classically trained music background, where the emphasis on weaker beat in composing technique is uncommon. The popularity of novelty piano music style grew partly because of its dissemination through piano rolls, but the mainstream popular genre in the music industry in relation to what happened after ragtime was jazz. But jazz didn't just grow out of ragtime, it also grew out of blues and fusions from elements of the European music traditions. The first time the word jazz was used in a musical context appeared in mid-1910s, spelled as J-A-S-S or J-A-S. If we're talking about the world's first jazz on record, most of the time it's accredited to the original Dexy Jazz Band in 1917, who released two songs, Livery Stable Blues and Dixie Jazz Band One Step. Actually, it was the jazz bands that congregated in New Orleans in the late 1910s that brew and cultivated the beginnings of jazz. These jazz being called the Dixieland Jazz, also referred to as traditional jazz or hot jazz. In terms of pianists playing piano roles on jazz, Most of these were ragtime composers that continued to live through and transitioned into jazz. We're talking about U.B. Blake and Jelly Roll Morton. And of course, if we're talking about jazz on piano, we have to mention George Gershwin and his compositions. But Gershwin comes to the scene a bit later, I would say around mid-1920s, when he composed The Rhapsody in Blue, and his other compositions like Porgy and Bess is not until the 1930s. in jazz which is popular in its early recognition that is between mid-1910s and mid-1920s is again in its rhythmic pulse, its swing. And this is related to the notion of dance. During this time there was a shift in dance from society dancing to ballroom professional dance. The onset of this was in 1914 when Vernon and Irene Castle popularised the foxtrot after appearing in Irvine Berlin's first Broadway show, Watch Your Step. The couple also helped to promote the rhythms of ragtime and jazz rhythms. These factors combined resulted in a dance craze over the next two decades. Everyone wanted to be dancing, so that there was a demand for music that catered for people to do so. We see this becoming more and more of a marketing strategy in the piano roll industry. In particular, in 1925, the Aeolian company launched the Maloto Rolls, 
rose in colourful and attractive roll boxes in masquerade designs. In addition to dancing, the variety of musical styles in the popular genre, whether of ragtime, blues, jazz or dance itself, was conveyed in enormity through songs. The in-person method of promoting and mass performing this kind of music was at Tim Pan Alley. I find it quite humorous reading Louis Bernstein's experience being at Madison Square Gardens. He said that there were about 20,000 people there. They had a pianist and a singer with a large horn. They would sing a song to them 30 times a night. People would cheer and yell, and the musicians would keep pounding away at them. When people walked out at the end of the night, they would be singing the song. So that was the in-person method. The remote method was through piano rolls. But who got to choose what to include and why did they choose it? So we're going to spend the rest of this episode getting to know one particular individual, Edgar Fairchild. Edgar Fairchild, or those who know him by his official name at birth, Milton Suskin, was born in New York City in 1898. In 1914, at the age of 16, he graduated with honours from the Institute of Musical Arts, which now is the Julia School, having been omitted to the programme on a scholarship. After his studies, Edgar Fairchild did consider a career as a piano virtuoso, but in 1916, the American Piano Company offered him a job as editor of their then-new reproducing piano system known as Empico. This was an offer which Edgar Fairchild didn't want to refuse, as he was the youngest of four children with a widowed mother. And so he accepted the job and became the editor-in-chief for Ampico's recording department between 1917 and 1925. In addition to being the editor, he was the in-house pianist and the manager of the recording department. Being the manager meant that he oversaw the recordings that appeared on the market. And as the company recorded all genres of music, Edgar Fairchild had to upskill to be proficient in all genres, including music that he was not familiar with at that time, to be explicit, pop. And he demonstrated that he was able to do so by making arrangements of classical music into popular trends. He was respected by both popular and classical pianists. It was said that when Rachmaninoff recorded for Ampico, he would only let Milton Suskin edit his roles. Adam Carroll, a famous pianist of the popular genre, also praised Edward Fairchild in his ability to straddle both styles. He said that he's never met any named pianist who could play both classical and pop music equally well. I think that the reason why he was able to maintain respect from so many pianists across the two genres was because he engaged frequently in playing piano four hands or six hands. He played four hand duets on piano rolls in the classical field with Arthur Lucet and Julius Berger, and from 1922, he was actively forming trios and duos with other pianists in the popular genre. One of the groups that Edgar Fairchild was known for was this trio called the Original Piano Trio, which was formed with Herbert Clare and George Dilworth in 1922. This group became a big hit in 1922. They performed in George White's Scandal and played I'll Build a Stairway to Paradise with Poor White Man's Orchestra. With this group, he made 24 roles, which were released between 1922 and 1923. The trio played on two pianos, sometimes three, and they would make arrangements from existing music into rich, lush musical texture with flourished embellishment. The trio's main musical style is jazz, some of the elements being derived from ragtime and some of the elements typifying the style of dance orchestras. And we can hear some of these characteristics through the arrangement of Rimsky Kosakov's Song of India. Song of India is a popular song which originates from the aria, Song of the Indian Guests, in Rimsky Kosakov's 1898 opera, Sadko. The original feeling of this composition is in bel canto sing style and a ballad pace, and this feeling is replicated in classical arrangements, whether that's Fritz Kreisler's arrangement for violin and piano in 1919, or Alexander Salotti's 1927 arrangement for piano solo. 
Interestingly, Milton Susskind also recorded on Ampico an arrangement of his Song of India, and this arrangement is a really different mood to how he did it with his trio. Let's now compare briefly the two side by side. This is Milton Susskind's take for solo piano. And this is his take with his trio. In terms of what Edgar himself recorded on piano rolls, he recorded under both his names, Milton Susskind and Edgar Fairchild, as well as also under other names, Sasha Baranoff, Enrico Lavara, Henry Lefebvre, Corinne Lebert, and possibly others we have still yet to find out about. It was quite common in those days for employed in-house pianists and piano rolls to use pseudonyms, as it makes it look like the companies hired a lot of pianists to make recordings. This tactic could potentially increase sales, as more arranged pianists suggest more variety. In the case of Edgar Fairchild, he uses Fairchild for popular music, Suskin mostly for classical works, and Corinne de Bert to a salon of a certain type. In fact, two of these fake names were shared amongst other real pianists. For example, Adam Carroll also pretended to be Corinne de Bert and Harry Shipman. In total, the number of roles made under the names that we're certain of being played by Edgar Fairchild, including his piano duets and triets, is just over 200. Now, I looked at five different catalogues to come up with these statistics. Every time I come to a different catalogue, I'm finding additional roles. So these statistics I'm presenting is to review a general trend rather than for the numbers to be taken literally. 40% were under the name of Milton Susskind, and as said earlier, majority of these were recordings of classical works. But his selection of repertoire is quite different to a mainstream classical concert performing pianist. While it's more like an encore, for the piano-specific pieces, there are only a few represented like Liszt's Liebestrom, Schumann's Toccata, Mussorgsky's Caprice Espagnol, a movement of Beethoven's Sonata, a Brahms Intermezzo. The larger proportions of his recordings were arrangements from other instrumental favourites, particularly extractions from operatic or symphonic repertoires. There were a couple of his own compositions, the humorous Capricious and Florida Girl, a vows ballet. If we look at the 1925 Ampico catalogue, we see that there is a picture of him, Milton Suskin, and the language used to describe the pieces that he was playing and the depiction of how he played convinces us that this person is very much a virtuosic classical pianist. For example, in describing Mazowski's Caprice Espanol, it reads, a brilliant work in the Spanish style full of delicious Spanish rhythm and a constant play of light and shade, concluding with a passage calling upon all the technical resources of the pianist, a most effective number. Staying on the 1925 Ampico catalog, by contrast, if we look under Edgar Fairchild, there is no picture of the pianist, and not even a bio. The pieces that Fairchild recorded were of the popular genre, Songs from Tim Pan Alley, music of the novelty piano style, ballads and dance. This was further emphasised by the way that the language is used throughout describing the pieces, like favourite, popular, appealing, salon, and how there was hardly any mentioning of pianistic technique. For example, in describing Fairchild's own composition, Vows in the Net, it reads, Fascinating in its grace, Dainty as the fair Nanette who lends her name to this charming salon number, who will find ready for it a warm welcome. 
Even though Edgar Fairchild appears to be the lesser pianist, he actually made more roles under this name, about 50% of what I counted. In this respect, we can argue that because he was so well known, he needs no further introduction to his audience. This is also perhaps the reason why he continued with this name, Edgar Fairchild, in his career. I mentioned about the success with his trio, the original piano trio. In 1925, the trio performed in Earl Carroll's nightclub theatre, where Edgar made more connections with people in the popular genre, and from there emerged the Fairchild and Carroll team, and later Fairchild and Ranger team. These partnerships saw a few years of success and popularity on Broadway shows. In 1928, Edgar went to London, and then the year afterwards, in 1929, he paired up with Robert Lincoln, the two being described as twin pianists and frequently appeared on the radio, the recording being relayed from the Café de Paris. Then, Edgar Fairchild went on to being the music director for Eddie Cantor for 13 years writing musical scores for motion pictures, and retired in 1951. There were also many others like Edgar Fairchild, who were in-house pianists and editors at the role-making companies, some being more known for their reputation beyond role-making, and some lesser known and more behind the scenes. These people make up a huge proportion of piano roles in both the reproducing and player piano industry. And it is through these people that we come to know what music was popular to their audience in the 1910s and 1920s, whether that was music that existed from previous genres updated to modern arrangements, or music that was here today gone tomorrow. The recording editors in the piano roll industry had a huge say in musical interpretations as we see and hear. And the same could be said for any music recording and production companies today. And on that note, we're gonna end this episode. See you next time.